All right. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about cancer and about three very important words. You have cancer. I remember those words sort of tumbling out of my mouth. They weren't elegantly polished in the way I had sort of learned in medical school, actually here at Duke, sitting in the building across the street. They didn't have any of the, the poignant pauses that I had practiced in the mirror on my first day as a doctor at the University of Chicago. None of the elegance, just words, sort of awkward, clumsy, sort of taking all of the space in this tiny little room, sucking the air out of the fluorescent lighting, and just sort of hanging there in space. I sat with Bonnie, my patient, as she called her sister crying, telling her that the mass that we had found in her nose, the abnormal mass, was indeed cancer. I remember handing her this dinky, dinky little packet of Kleenex that I had found in a random supply closet somewhere. I remember seeing her hands trembling and grabbing them. And I remember telling her that we would figure this out, that we were going to send her to specialists, that we would figure out what treatment she needed, and then with her still sniffling, I remember walking down with her to the lobby, watching her get in her Uber and drive away. The next time I saw Bonnie was actually several months later. And to be honest with all of you guys, honestly, if I hadn't seen her name on my clinic list, I don't think I would have recognized her. The couple of months had been really hard. At that point, she had lost 40 pounds, her face had been completely reshaped by surgery after surgery, trying to get after this tumor, and her right eye was completely gone. I remember her telling me that she was tired, and I looked at her, and all I could think was, of course you are. Bonnie's cancer was one of the bad ones. And that sounds weird to say, because like, what do I mean? Good cancers, bad cancers, there's cancers that will kill you and cancers that won't. I used to think, quite honestly, that there was just cancer, just this one terrifying entity that the moment those three words were sort of spilled into space, you have cancer, all of a sudden you got sort of swept away into treatments, into chemotherapies that made you sick, into radiation therapies that hurt, and into surgeries that would deform you. I, I used to think it was just one thing. And I held on to that idea for a really long time, even doing my undergrad at Harvard, even doing my MD and my PhD here at Duke, I held on to the idea that cancer was this monolith, that there was one thing, and all of those doctors and scientists out there in the news who were looking for a cure for cancer, they were just looking for one miracle drug, one miracle treatment, where once we had that, we would have fixed cancer. We would have fixed it for everyone. And it turns out I was wrong. It turns out that that is not the way cancer works at all. And in fact, even asking for a universal cure for cancer is the wrong pursuit. And let me tell you why. Because it turns out cancer isn't just one thing. It's an umbrella term that we slap onto hundreds of different conditions, named for every single place in the body where cells can grow haywire. And here's the thing, cells are supposed to grow. I mean, when you fall and you scrape your knee, your skin cells are supposed to grow back. When you have that spicy bowl of ramen and you're, you got a little tummy ache, your cells in your gut are supposed to grow back. They're supposed to replace themselves every seven days so you can digest that dish. But what happens when cells stop getting the signals? When they start ignoring all of the things that tell them, you know, that's great, me, it's fixed now. Or they stop hearing the thing that says, that gut, it's replaced now, we can calm down. What happens then? Well, then you get cancer. Any condition 
where there are more cells than those that are supposed to be there. So how do you cure cancer? How do we even talk about that? Well, let's talk about something where we do have a cure, right? Let's talk about a bacterial infection. You go to the doctor, you get some antibiotics, cured, right? Well, here's the thing. If you take bacteria and you take your normal cells, swab the inside of your cheek, you stick them on a microscope and you take some bacteria next to it, they look totally different. You take antibiotics, you pour them on both of those cells, you'll kill the bacteria and your normal cells will be fine. So boom, cure. Now let's take that to cancer. You take some cancer cells and you take your normal cells, you stick them both under a microscope, they don't really look that different. So you pour bleach on both, you're gonna kill both, but that's not really a cure. So where do we even start thinking about cures, right? What am I even talking about when I say a cure for cancer? Well, I would argue that you actually have to break down that question a little bit. It's the wrong question to ask. The questions we should be asking are, well, what makes the cancer cell different than the normal cell? In fact, what makes the skin cell of your knee different from a normal skin cell or a gut cancer different from the gut or a brain cancer different from the brain? And it turns out these are questions that brilliant people have been asking for a really long time. And in fact, one of the most important frameworks for how we think about this is actually something called the hallmarks of cancer. First sort of introduced in 2000 by Robert Weinberg and some of his colleagues, then later revised in 2011. These are essentially a checklist of traits, of things that cancer cells learn to do that makes them cancer. And there is a lot of stuff on there. There is stuff ranging from stopping all of those signals that tell them to stop growing, ignoring all of those, that's one of them, changing their metabolism, changing how they process energy in order to be able to grow like crazy, that's another one of them, uh, being able to pull blood vessels towards the tumor to make you actually, to make the tumor actually get nutrients, that's another one of them. And if you guys will humor me, right now we are going to take a step further. We're gonna take this up a notch and for a second, you guys are going to become oncologists, cancer specialists with me. Because it turns out every single one of those hallmarks has spawned an entire host of different therapies and different cure approaches that the field of oncology thinks about. And it's really, really cool. So you guys ready? Let's focus in on one of these, okay? We talk about chemotherapy all the time. Blunt instrument, we kill all fast-growing cells. Doesn't matter if that's a tumor or if it's the gut cells, we kill everything. But let's talk about more targeted therapies. Let's focus in on what cancer actually does. So let's look at cell death, evading cell death. So I told you that cancer cells start ignoring all of those signals that tell them that it's time to stop growing, time to die. All of those signals get ignored. Well, it turns out part of the reason they do that is because there are mutations in different genes. And we have come up with an entire class of drugs that actually look at those mutations, find them, and kill them. And in fact, that approach, as cool as it sounds, kind of getting old now. In fact, one of the earliest drugs of that class, this drug called Gleevec, actually targets this weird genetic mutation, like a conglomeration of two different genes that shouldn't exist, that exists only in some blood cancers. It actually targets that, has been out since 2001, and at this point, for people with chronic myelogenous leukemia, one of those blood cancers, this is a cure. And there are so many others out there that we are developing each and every single day. But let's talk about something else. Let's talk about angiogenesis. You know that process I was telling you where, where the tumor actually starts pulling blood vessels towards it so it gets the nutrients and it gets the blood? Turns out we have come up with some drugs that actually blocks that too. For some cancers, that's a cure. And let's not even get into the immune system. Just kidding, I will get into the immune system because a key factor of a lot of cancers is that they actually trick the immune system into ignoring them. 
Usually your immune system should recognize the threat and take it out, but they often don't in the case of cancer. And we have come up with drugs that actually block those checkpoints, block the points at which the immune system is getting tricked and activate the immune system against cancer as well. And that's not even getting into even cooler approaches that we are coming up with, including things like CAR T cell therapy, where we take the immune system out of the body, stick it in a dish with some cancer cells, train it up, and then stick the immune system back in to fight cancer. These are all approaches that we are working on each and every day. And if you think that's overwhelming, imagine being in a tiny, fluorescently lit room with a woman that you have just told that she has cancer and thinking of all of those things because that was going through my head in that very first meeting with Bonnie. I was thinking about how those tumor cells in her nose were different from every other cell in her nose. I was thinking about how it was tricking the immune system, why her immune system wasn't recognizing that the thing growing in her nose was an invader, that it was a threat. I was thinking about how what she ate that morning, oatmeal with berries, she told me, uh, actually was fueling the cancer throughout her body. That question, actually, interestingly, was the, the crux of my PhD work here at Duke. Um, I was also thinking about how those cancer cells in her nose, how those were surviving in the completely different environment in the nodules on her lungs that had also been discovered as her cancer had spread. All of those things were going through my mind, and that's just for Bonnie. Let's take my next patient, Robert. Totally different story. Just diagnosed with testicular cancer. He had had a burger for lunch. Uh, he had a worried wife and child at home. He was ha having a completely different experience. His cancer hasn't spread, and within a year, he was cured. So that's why we need to dispel this myth that cancer is a monolith, and that so is its cure. It turns out there's not one cure for cancer out there. There's a different cure for Bonnie's cancer, for Robert's cancer, and maybe for the cancer of somebody that you love. It's a completely different, multifaceted thing. And if around this point you're sort of like, okay, Shri, kind of sounds like doctors, scientists, they understand these nuances, like they're working on it, you, you got it, why do I need to know about this? Here's why it's important to you. Because you need to understand the breadth and depth of what cancer is. Because if you understand that if you take a normal cell and a cancer cell and you look at them under the microscope and they look the same until it's too late, then you understand why it's important for us to get screenings for breast cancer and cervical cancer and colon cancer. If you understand that we're not looking for one cure, we're looking for hundreds of cures and we're finding them, then you understand why we need funding for these innovative new ideas, why we need policies that help us. And because if you understand what we're doing, we all make progress together. And the next time those three words are spilled into space, when somebody is told you have cancer, maybe we'll have better answers, better treatments, and better outcomes. Bonnie, um, Bonnie passed away recently. Uh, the treatments didn't work, as they so often don't, and her tumor grew, and eventually it was too much for her body. Um, I think about that first conversation really often because I, I wish it had been different. I wish I could have told her, your cancer is one of the good ones. We have treatments, you're gonna be fine. Um, in a couple of months, this is just gonna be a distant memory for you. That wasn't the case. Um, instead of being able to tell her that, as I go on to my career in oncology and taking care of so many more Bonnies to come, I'll instead hold her in my memory forever instead. Thank you.